thank you, John, and I appreciate you inviting me here to, to give me this opportunity to speak. So I'm going to talk, um, the main topic uh, of my talk is going to be about pain and how some research in my lab, um, I'm hoping, will gain an understanding of the biology of pain in such a way that may help us to develop better therapeutic approaches for its control. But there's going to be sort of a, um, another theme running through this, and that's going to be discussing how um, animals other than rats and mice, such as the leech, can be useful model systems uh, for learning about how our brains work and what the utility of using this kind of research is. So, next slide. so what is pain? The technical term for pain is nociception, and it simply refers to stimuli um, that can induce um, damaging or, uh, or an injury to us. Um, it is detected by sensory cells that innervate the skin, and they are distinct from our non-pain sensory cells. That is distinct from sensory cells that detect things like light, light touch or sustained pressure. They both travel to the spinal cord and take distinct pathways through the spinal cord and up into the brain. Now, uh, next slide. We typically think of pain as being bad. But pain has a very positive protective element to us and has what we call this adaptive element. It protects us from getting further damaged or further injured or even killed. So whenever you're stepping on a nail and pulling your foot away, that's your pain sensory cells initiating a defensive behavioral response. And without those responses, without those pain sensing cells, you would be uh, liable for even more damage. The problem is, is that pain, our perception of pain within the brain can be modified and so that it's increased to a level that it becomes maladaptive. One type of maladaptive pain would be an increased response to a painful stimuli. It's still a legitimately painful stimuli, but our response, our perception to it um, has been exaggerated. And so this is a kind of sensitiza sensitization. Another type of maladaptive pain would be a pain that, res that is elicited by non-painful stimuli. For example, a light touch or putting a shirt on even can elicit a painful response. This is a kind of sensitization that we call allodynia. And it's very difficult to understand because it's unclear whether this is a result of the pain sensors suddenly becoming more sensitive or is it the non-pain sensors are suddenly having access to the pain circuitry within our brain. Finally, there is pain that is unprovoked or spontaneous. And this is pain that may be the result of spontaneous activity of pain sensing neurons or other neurons within the pain pathway in the central nervous system. Now, from what I've just talked about, it's clear that our brain can modify our perception of pain to make things worse. Can it also modify our perception of pain to make things better? Can it have, do we have endogenous analgesic processes within our brain? And in fact, we do. And one of these processes is referred to as gate control of pain. So if you hit it. Normally, and hit it again, when a pain sensor is activated, a signal is transmitted up to the brain. But if you hit it again, uh, if you activate a non-pain sensory neuron, such as a touch sensor, you can actually ameliorate or even stop this pain signal from reaching the brain. You can decrease our perception of pain. Can you hit it again? And so this principle has actually been taken advantage of therapeutically um, with these units uh, called TENS units, or also, and there's one more, the spi uh, uh, therapy called spinal cord stimulation. So these are apparatus or therapeutic approaches that stimulate non-pain sensory cells to elicit this gate control response, okay? Now, they're very interesting, let's go back one, sorry. sorry. They're very interesting processes, and we know a fair amount about the biology of these, but there's more that we would like to know. For example, um, these TENS units, for example, are not always equally effective across everybody that they're tried on. If we understood the biology of them better, we might be able to use them more effectively. Another issue is that their analgesic effect actually outlasts the period for which they're being stimulated. So you can drive these TENS units for, say, 10 or 15 minutes, turn them off, 
and you'll still feel some relief from pain for tens of minutes, maybe even hours. But nobody knows what is that persistent process, what mediates that long-lasting effect of how we perceive pain. Okay. There's one more thing I want to tease in terms of concepts of the brain before we move on, and that's this idea of endocannabinoids. These are simply transmitters within the brain, and they're present in all animals. And they regulate things like cognition, anxiety, um, appetite, and pain. So there's a lot of interest among pharmaceutical companies for using uh, endocannabinoids as a potential way to control pain. Physiologically, endocannabinoids um, depress synaptic or suppress synaptic transmission. So, so normally, synaptic transmission is how neurons talk to each other. So if you electrically activate the signaling cell, that releases neurotransmitters, little chemicals, that then produce an electrical response on the target cell. Endocannabinoids, when they come on, reduce that signal by decreasing the amount of neurotransmitter that is actually being released. Now, some of you may be thinking endocannabinoids, cannabinoids. There's something about this word that <laughs> rings a bell. And you would be right. So, go ahead and hit it again. The word you're thinking of is cannabis, or tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the active ingredient in marijuana. So, when people are using marijuana, they're, the reason that it has the effects that it has is that it's mimicking the actual endogenous neurotransmitters that we already have in our brain. Now, I feel obligated as an employee of the state of South Dakota to say that I'm not advocating any use, um, therapeutic or non-therapeutic, of any illegal substances. But I do think that there's some genuine uses that can come out of manipulating this endocannabinoid system in a very controlled uh, manner. Now, the other, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about this uh, sort of other theme about using um, different kinds of animals for biomedical research. The reason I want to bring this up is, is that on a fairly regular <coughs> basis, and doubly so during election years, um, a scientist or a politician will come up and say, point to uh, a scientist doing research on an insect or a worm or a mollusk and say, look at this example of waste of money, you know, these scientists studying these, these, these silly little animals. And what I want to express is, is that whenever somebody studies these kinds of animals, it's not because they have some intrinsic interest in how a leech works or how a bug works. It's because they're using these animals to find out fundamental processes about how we work. So for example, the fruit fly, or this warm C. elegans are powerful molecular genetics um, systems for finding out how specific genes work. Animals like um, the zebrafish are used uh, to understand how the brain grows and develops and what are the signaling processes that are responsible for that. Animals such as Aplesia, which is a mollusk, or Baruto, the medicinal leech, are useful because they have very accessible nervous systems. It's very easy to do very fine, detailed, cellular measurements of individual neurons. So, next slide. So, why the leech in particular is good for this kind of research on pain that I'm going to be talking about is that the leech, like us, has sensory cells that detect light touch, which are called touch cells, sensory cells that detect sustained pressure, or pressure cells, and sensory cells that detect pain, nociceptive cells, okay? And so this is a picture of an individual ganglion, and there's 21 of these in each leech. And each of these little bubbles you see is an individual neuron that we can stick an electrode into and record uh, electrophysiologically or manipulate in some way. Now, it isn't quite as easy as this picture indicates. They don't come out with little T's, P's, and N's on them, but it is almost as easy as this. It is, uh, we can find these individual cells based on where they are in the ganglion and the proper, their electrical properties. And this is a powerful system. So in, even if we were trying to do this in a rat or a mouse spinal cord, you're still talking tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different neurons, and then all the put and potentially millions of different kinds of synaptic connections. What we can do is record from the same neuron from one experiment to the next 
and its same target cell, the cell that it talks to synaptically from one experiment to the next. And so that provides us with some power here. So one of the first things we wanted to look at was this gate control process that I discussed before. Can you see it at the synaptic level in the leech? So if you activate a pain sensory cell, and this is what the electrical activation looks like, that causes the release of neurochemical transmitters that produce an electrical response in the target cell. In this case, it was a motor neuron. And you can see that electrical response right there. And if we test this synaptic connection, this discussion between these two cells over a period of time, it stays relatively stable. But if we drive a touch sensory cell repetitively, like you would use for a TENS unit, for 15 minutes, you get a reduction in that synaptic communication compared to what it was before you delivered that repetitive stimulation. And you can see that it's about a 50% reduction, and it lasts for at least two hours, maybe longer. Okay. Oops. That's all right. Now, we wanted to know what was doing this. And it sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of jump to the, to the punchline here and, talk of, and say that it's endocannabinoids. But I will say that it took us a while to get to that point. That wasn't the first thing we were looking at. So we were trying to understand this long-term process and looking at various other chemicals that might have been involved. But it was endocannabinoids that ended up being, a, being uh, the, what was involved here. So we figured that out by repeating the same experiment, producing this reduction in synaptic transmission that you see here. And then when we repeated the experiment again, okay, we combined that touch sensory stimulus with a drug that inhibits endocannabinoid synthesis. So the nervous system can't make endocannabinoid transmitters anymore. And when we did that, that decrease in synaptic transmission was prevented. And you can see from this air bar here, unchanged relative to the control. So that showed us that we could, could produce a gate control-like phenomenon at the single synapse level in this leech ganglion, and that endocannabinoids played a critical role. Thanks. We also found out through further research that the endocannabinoids were actually made in the motor neuron itself and then released onto this pain-sensing neuron. We wanted to know whether or not what we saw at the synaptic level was relevant at the behavioral level. It's one thing to look at this tiny little synapse and say, yes, there's something going on here. Does it mean anything? And so we, re we repeated the experiment in a, situ in a situation where we could monitor both the behavior and the uh, synaptic communication at the same time. So just like us, if we touch something that's painful, we withdraw our hand. The leech, if it receives a noxious stimulation, will withdraw itself or shorten. And we could monitor the shortening response using electrodes, an electromyogram. So electrodes that record the muscle activity, basically. And so if we did nothing and just looked at um, the behavior and the synaptic transmission, as you would expect, nothing happens. It's a control experiment. But if we then repeat the touch, the repetitive touch sensor experiment, we see a reduction not only in the level of synaptic transmission, the pain synapse here, but we also see a reduction in the shortening behavior. Go again. And if we add an endocannabinoid in place of this touch sensor, don't stimulate it all, just add our own endocannabinoids to the nervous system, we get a similar reduction in the behavior in the synaptic transmission. So what this told us was, was that the effect that we were looking at wasn't just at one synapse. It was actually important at a circuit level that supported this behavior. It was behaviorally relevant. All right. What do we think this is important for? We think that it may be possible, and we're very far away from this final point, obviously. It may be possible to combine TENS therapy with an endocannabinoid acting drug. So what we think is happening is, is that the stimulation from the TENS unit is stimulating some sort of endocannabinoid production. So the analogy for us would be it would be stimulating endocannabinoid production in our spinal cord. 
if we apply an endocannabinoid acting drug, for example, something that would pr prolong or strengthen that endocannabinoid synthesis, we might be able to make up a combination therapy that would improve on the TENS component of this, but also use endocannabinoids in a way that wouldn't generate the psychotropic effects necessarily, okay? And so we're still, the pharmaceutical industry is still trying to develop an endocannabinoid drug that can be used that specifically and that safely, uh, but this is but, but this is sort of the, uh, the, the, the fu what we think the future may hold for this sort of approach. Okay. I'm not doing too bad here as far as time goes. So in a lot of talks uh, or in a lot of uh, presentations about biomedical research, you frequently hear all the good things without the caveats or potential disadvantages. And so I want to break that mold a little bit here uh, because there always is a catch. And so, hit it again. So, as I've already said, the pain, synaptic transmission from these pain synapses, okay, is depressed by these endocannabinoids. But there are other sensory synapses out there besides these pain synapses, so go again. And we've actually found that if we look at a non-painful synapse, a synapse from a pressure-sensitive neuron onto this particular motor neuron, we found that the endocannabinoids actually increased neurotransmission and actually increased it in a way that indicates that more neurotransmitters is being released. We're still trying to work out why this is and I can go into more detail in the question and answer period if anyone's interested. Um, but what this shows is is that you can't, we, we don't want to take this approach of endocannabinoids and apply it universally to all sorts of pain syndromes. So let's skip this one and go to the. So for example, we think that Hit it again. Endocannabinoids might be potentially effective for this sort of exaggerated pain response to legitimately painful stimuli because that's involving that pain synapse and we've shown that these pain synapses are sensitive to these neurotransmitters. Okay. We don't think that endocannabinoids are going to be good for this kind of um, sensitization where non-painful stimulus is producing a painful response because uh, we've already shown, as we showed in the previous slide, endocannabinoids may be actually potentiating that kind of synaptic communication. And finally, we think that endocannabinoids may also be sent, may in fact be useful for this unprovoked pain, pain that is not, uh, that is produced um, uh, without any actual stimulus because we think that that pain is the result of spontaneous activity of the pain sensory cells that are involved. Okay. So thank you for your attention and I'll take on any questions but before I do I'd like to thank my collaborators uh, Dr. Brenda Moss um, uh, at the University of South Dakota and the students in my lab who have done really all this work, Charlene Yin who's actually here uh, and Ali, uh, Alexander Higgins uh, did most of the work that I talked about and then my other students, Tori Summers and Flora Wong, who's also here, are uh, currently sort of following up the next stages of this sort of experiment. So thank you.